Hello, thank you for joining us. We'll be starting uh, the session in a few minutes. Thank you for joining us. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. All right, I think uh, we, we can start. This is, it, it's always a pleasure to, to do this conference. It's, it's one of my favorite events about uh, quantitative uh, uh, trading and quantitative finance uh, uh, every year. Today, we're gonna be discussing a topic that is very close to my heart, that is uh, quant strategies for, for crypto assets. It's an area that I spend a lot of time uh, as part of my, my company into the blog and just doing uh, active research in the space. Uh, we have a lot of content, so I'm going to go super fast, but just a little bit of an intro about myself. Uh, I'm currently the CEO of a company going to the blog that we sit at the intersection of machine learning and crypto assets, doing both uh, market intelligence as well as quantitative strategies uh, for crypto assets. I have had a, a long career in tech as a um, uh, running uh, cloud team at Microsoft, building quant systems at a, a couple of major uh, funds. I teach apply AI at Columbia University, a couple of exits as an entrepreneur, investor in over 20 or so machine learning and crypto projects. Uh, do a lot of speaking engagement and publish like a, what I think is a decently popular machine learning newsletter called The Sequence that has over 100,000 uh, subscribers, uh, including some of the top AI labs in, in the world. About the work that we do at Into the Blog, uh, imagine that we collect every single data point that we can have about crypto assets and run a ton of data science machine learning models on top of it, trying to compute indicators that are very unique to crypto. Uh, the company is a little bit less than two years old, has over 180 uh, of the top institutional brands as customers. And then we have a division that works, that it, it was just incubated this year, works in creating quant strategies for crypto assets, very focused on the, the area of decentralized finance that we're gonna talk uh, quite a bit about uh, as one of the, the the points in this presentation, and in just a few months, we're uh, already over half a billion in assets deployed uh, on the platform, doing both high frequency trading and more quantitative geo. Uh, Estrada is very uh, most of it powered by uh, machine learning and deep learning signals. So today's session is a little bit of. Uh, practical lessons that we have learned. So I want to cover a few things like what makes quantitative strategies in crypto different and unique, some of the unique sources of alpha that you find in crypto uh, in crypto land that, that have no equivalent in other capital uh, uh, markets. Uh, a little bit of uh, decentralized finance sort of as a new frontier for high frequency trading and how, how we think about the space, marketing efficiencies in crypto, new types of asset classes like NFTs, uh, some reasons why most uh, quant strategies, including the ones we built in crypto, sort of failed, uh, and some areas of deep learning, machine learning that we're excited about that we think could play a role in crypto. As I said, we have a lot of content to cover, so I'm going to go very fast, but if you have any questions, feel free to use uh, uh, the, the, the chat panel, and I'm going to stop multiple times during the presentation to try to, to answer uh, that questions. So quantitative strategies in crypto are very different. Crypto is a 100% programmable digital uh, asset class. So 
it makes sense that requires a, a, a new type of strategies and techniques that, that we haven't seen before. But what exactly makes uh, quant strategies in crypto different? From, there are many factors, but I think most of them boil down to four fundamental categories. So there are sources of alpha that are very unique. There are financial primitives such as lending market making and all that that are programmable in nature, which is something that we don't see in other uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, capital market. The, the, there is a ton of inefficiency, so many that it's almost like a regular, I call it re regularly inefficient uh, market. And then there are new type of assets being created all the time that trade using dynamics that do not correspond to the, to the overall uh, crypto market. So most of the, uh, the factors that you can find about uh, uh, unique quantitative, uh, uh, the, the power unique quantitative strategies in crypto, uh, they, they sort of fall into one of these categories. And the first part of this session, I, I want to break this down a little bit uh, for you. So let's start with sources of alpha that are unique in crypto. And fundamentally today, that means blockchain data sets. So the fact that part of the uh, behavior of groups of investors in crypto is recorded in public ledgers that are up there to be analyzed and intelligence can be extracted from it is something that is very, uh, very unique to crypto and that has no equivalent in any other uh, in any other asset class. So what are some of the things that you can do with this type of information? Uh, and I'm going to show you some of the techniques that we have used in that you can find in, in just pure analytics and into the blog. But just as an example, not 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 to refer to the product itself, but just as an example of the type of richness of information that you can find that could be conducive uh, to to alpha signals, and that that are things that probably uh, are not you cannot find in any other asset class. So, for instance, some ideas having access to positions in different wallets in public ledgers. You can do profitability analysis and figure out what, how many investors, so groups of investors, not exact, but a statistical relevant number, are close to different price movements. Uh, this is an analysis that we call in and out of the money that essentially uh, identifies all the wallets with certain proximity to, to the current price and uses some very basic clustering techniques to segment that groups into different categories. And what it gives you is very objective uh, models of support and resistance. I, I took this a snapshot uh, before the market crash yesterday because I, I have like very, very good timing like that. And essentially you can see some groups, some clusters that are holding Bitcoin between 51 to 53, 53 to 54, 70 and things like that. So what that tells you if the price was going to go up, these are levels of, uh, of potential uh, resistance and, and there's some levels of support uh, very strong at this level, and not surprisingly, Bitcoin has been able to hold between 46 to 47,000, even with a very aggressive uh, market crash. So this is the type of information that you can get from just analyzing individual wallets that typically you don't get when you're trading equities or commodities or, or things like that. Other type of uh, information that is that is interesting is you can actually monitor if you if you can figure out which exchanges belong to different types, groups of relevant categories, let's say like exchanges, you can monitor flows moving in and out of those exchanges. So in this type of techniques, we use some machine learning classification to identify addresses that are uh, that are belong to, to centralized exchanges. And then you can analyze how much money is going in or out. And then money going into an exchange could, f could, could fuel a specific trading activity, particularly for selling. Uh, signal, so it could be a bearish sign, a movie, movie, uh, money being taken out could be people going to cash uh, and staying out of uh, uh, active trading. You can do the same for other categories like miners, right? Miners are a very important important demographic in crypto, and the funds moving in and out of of, of mining uh, pools it is it could be used as a bearish or bullish signal depending on the market momentum. Another type of analysis that is super interesting is uh, timing, right? Trying to understand how many wallets are holding assets for a specific periods of time. In the case of Bitcoin or Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, this type of blockchains that is called UTXO type of blockchain, there is a type of feel in the type of transaction that you do in those assets that, that you can analyze to give you a very good idea of the time at which that Bitcoin was, that specific Bitcoin was purchased. 
So we aggregate all that information and uh, an analysis that you can do that we consider quite interesting is aggregating all that information over time and you can see movement between different categories. So you can see Bitcoins that were being held for over a year starting to be trade. You can see uh, 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 like short term uh, purchases like Bitcoins that are being just purchased and traded and sold in, in within the same 24 hour period or being held for a year. So it gives you an idea of what are the holding patterns. Are people buying or holding for a long period of time? Are long time holders selling? Are long time holders accumulating more? And that you can extrapolate different bullish bearish signals uh, based on that information. So, and those are just four examples, but there is obviously very uh, many more. In general, you should think about blockchain data sets as a very unique source of alpha in, uh, in crypto asset, one that you haven't seen before in any other asset classes and fundamentally give you uh, a way to analyze the behavior, to extrapolate intelligence from the behavior of groups of investors. It's not exact, uh, but it's a very good statistical approximation. Uh, that is a good uh, statistical approximation of what's happening in the market. The, uh, another aspect that is very unique in terms of quantitative strategies in crypto is this idea of new financial primitive that are, uh, that are programmable in nature. Specifically, the biggest manifestation of this is what we call decentralized uh, finance. So this is a market that have gone from 5 billion last year to 80 billion or more uh, this year. And it's really booming and there is a ton of activity uh, in, in this space. And, and fundamentally, what DeFi does is abstract some financial primitive that we use in any capital market, such as lending, market maker, derivative, and things like that, as programmable smart contracts that anybody can invoke, that you can compose into any other primitive and, and things like that. In general, we believe that uh, DeFi is sort of a next frontier for high frequency trading. So the evolution of HFT. Uh, is based on some basic uh, of some technological uh, improvements in, in capital markets. Obviously, the first one was when the market became electronics, electronic at the beginning of the 2000s. Then there was a movement of the dark pools and things like that, that started sort of the, the traditional HFT schools. And from there, most uh, technology movements have been incremental, nothing particularly disruptive. We think that DeFi uh, it, it provides sort of a, sort of a new spectrum of HF for HFT techniques. So when you think of HFT strategies in the context of DeFi, there are some factors that make it very very unique, and that uh, that are essentially DeFi and HFT is not about speed anymore. It's not about who is faster. You actually need to compete with other dynamics based on what a strategy is actually better. It's it's not enough to be fast. For instance, it doesn't matter how fast you are, you're limited by what is called the block time. In, in crypto assets, every transaction has a, is mining a block, and those blocks are produced on a specific schedule. In the case of the Ethereum blockchain, it's every six, seven seconds. In our blockchains are faster, but you cannot be faster than the block time. So HFT in DeFi doesn't mean microseconds. It means block time, which means that you can also do more sophisticated computations and more sophisticated strategies that take probably a couple of seconds to compute and still be very, very sophisticated. The other thing is this idea that everything is visible. So HFT strategies in traditional market lives in obscurity, right? You don't see what your competition is doing. Your competition doesn't see what you're doing. Now, try to extrapolate that to a world in which every transaction is on chain. I can clearly see what my competitors are trying to do and all my competitors can see what I'm trying to do. So it's, it's sort of a different gaming dynamic that you need to adjust to and it fundamentally changes the way that you think about HFT strategies. There is also a cost. So for the most part, HFT strategies the cost of executing HFT strategies in traditional asset classes is fixed, right? You can estimate that based on your infrastructure costs and this and that. Uh, but it, but in, uh, in crypto, is, uh, is, uh, it changes, right? Every transaction has a cost. At a cost, you sh is something that sh you should evaluate uh, to formulate your strategy. So you could have the perfect viable trade, and then the cost could be so high that you end up losing money. So this is a factor, this is a vector that you need to consider that, that is not present in traditional HFT strategies. And there is this concept of minor, minor, minor extractable value uh, that is sort of new. 
in crypto, but the idea is that miners are uh, are important part of the uh, of any trade in DeFi because ultimately miners are responsible for ordering transactions in a block, and they could have any discretion, any criteria to do that. So ultimately, you can have a perfect trade, and if the miner decides to put you in the front order in that block, then somebody can bid you to it. So knowing how much to pay a miner in order to get a transaction process is another vector uh, that you should consider. So we think this space is fascinating. It's probably the most interesting thing that has happened in the context of DeFi, I'm sorry, in the context of high frequency trading in the next decade or so. And it's, uh, and it's it probably uh, it's sort of a renaissance for, for this type of HFT techniques that is not only now based on speed and the data sets are the same. Here, everything is different. Uh, you're talking about programmable protocols. You're talking about new data sets. You're talking not only about a speed, but you actually need to compete in quality of, of, of the strategies. So it's sort of a new dimension for, for HFT. So that's the second point that we think is very unique. Uh, about crypto for quant strategies. The third point is this idea of regularly inefficient market. So we all know that all, every capital market has inefficiencies, but in crypto, there's so many. They're so frequent that we just think it's just part, part of the uh, part of the day-to-day -day business. So some of those inefficiencies are, for instance, information asymmetry. The people that are close to protocols, the people that are working with a specific project, they just have access to way more information than you have. There is no such a concept as publicly uh, material information in crypto, right? Everything, everything counts. So you need to play in a world in which you should assume that other people have more access to information uh, than you do. Then news have a disproportional impact in crypto. So it's just very difficult for news to move uh, a particular market in, uh, in US equities or things like that. It has to be something massive. But in crypto, every stupid news can, can actually have uh, a very impact, uh, very impactful uh, uh, momentum in the market. Based on that, there is a lot of uh, event-driven trades, right? So think of equivalent of the trade that you will do uh, when there is an M&A or, or a spin-off in, in traditional capital markets. Here will be like a token gets listed in an exchange or things like that. There is a massive trade that uh, massive opportunities created by these trades. Then in crypto, you have the world centralized exchanges and decentralized finance, and between those two there is like tremendous arbitrage opportunities because they behave, they, they move based on somewhat different market dynamics. So every day you have assets priced in some way in centralized exchanges and in other ways in decentralized exchanges. And, and there is some very clear arbitrage there. And there, there is just arbitrage across different protocols in, in DeFi. And I'm going to show you uh, some, uh, some ideas uh, about that. And these are just some examples, right? Like uh, inefficiencies are everywhere in crypto and it's something that you should account for. So for instance, this, uh, this is an example of Twitter sentiment for this cryptocurrency called Cardano that is, I think it's today's three or fourth uh, by, uh, by market cap and has grown tremendously in the last, uh, in the last few, uh, few weeks. So Twitter sentiment doesn't really move the price for any U.S. equity or, or anything in a meaningful way. Now, look at this chart. I mean, it's just disproportionately positive. Now, look at the price line compared to the sentiment, and the correlation is astonishing. So that tells you that people are basically trading based on what's being said on Twitter or some news or, or things like that in, in a way that it just doesn't make it, it. There is no equivalent in any other asset classes. This is a screenshot of lending and borrowing rates for different lending protocols in decentralized finance, look at the differences. So these are borrow rates for this currency called DAI or for Ethereum in different lending markets. Like it just doesn't take a genius to arbitrage a lot of these things, right? Borrowing some, lending others, and, and things like that. And there is all sorts of very basic strategies that you can formulate around, uh, around this concept. Then the last point I wanted to cover in, in terms of the fourth aspect that make uh, that make crypto uh, very unique for Quan is this idea of new type of digital assets that are being formed that are somewhat the dynamics of it of them they don't quite correlate with the dynamics of the underlying market. The canonical example for this is say is non fungible tokens that are just causing uh, an entire revolution uh, in crypto, and this is a very 
clear, clear example of a type of digital asset class built on crypto sustained by crypto infrastructure and that is still trades in a fundamentally different way that, than, that the underlying uh, crypto infrastructure. So NFTs are fundamentally collectibles, right? They're popular in things like art or, or music or, or gaming assets uh, and things like that. Uh, are assets that, that give you a sense of ownership of a specific piece that is unique and you can uh, fractionalize it and trade it uh, and things uh, and things like that. And we're seeing that from, from artist pieces to all sorts of very basic uh, uh, pictures that are being sold for, uh, for a lot of money. So uh, the, the NFT market trades in, in like just very crazy and efficient dynamics today. This is an index that has been created uh, to just track the price of uh, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this asset, and, and the inefficiencies in this in this index are are they're very visible. So there there is all sorts of traditional arbitrage between the index and the underlying asset that are that are being executed today. And then if you want to put in perspective, why is this happening? Uh, why uh, why is this dynamic so frequent? Is because the momentum in the market is crazy. So this has been the volume of NFT trades uh, by day from, uh, uh, from mid, uh, mid June to, uh, uh, to August. And you can see the increase is insane, right? So it doesn't correlate with any rational uh, market. There's an entire frenzy to get into this type of asset class. And th this is creating this proportional alpha opportunities uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this space. Then uh, there is a ton of opportunities for quantitative strategies in crypto, and yet most of them, most of the ones we build, most of the ones most quant funds build, they fail. So what are some of the challenges that are very unique to crypto quant strategies uh, this, and that cause some, most of those strategies to fail despite of the asymmetric opportunities? So if you're a quant in a traditional uh, one phone, a lot of this stuff is going to be like science fiction, right? Like it's a type of challenge that you don't typically run into it that at least I find it very, uh, very specific for crypto. One of those is the data sets are particularly small. You can see some of this in emerging markets, uh, but, uh, but in crypto, uh, in, not, not in, in U.S. equities, in U.S. commodities, we're accustomed to see like uh, massive data sets that you could have almost for, for hundreds of years uh, of data in crypto. You're, you're you're talking about a few years of data, if that, and then most of machine learning models that you try to train on this stuff, uh, it typically don't, don't generalize uh, very well. Then you have this problem of regular outlier events. So as I said before, inefficiencies in crypto, outlier events, massive trade, massive crashes like yesterday are just, uh, they happen every day, but because uh, they're so um, atypical, it's just hard to train a model to react to those because almost every day is seeing events that it hasn't seen before. So if you train it too much, then it tends to overfit. If you don't train it enough, it tends to get killed. Uh, so it's one of those things that is very difficult uh, to, um, uh, to, to predict, Try right? to be prepared for this type of regular, uh, regularly outlier events. And this causes what we call the regular training dilemma, which is that if, if events if market crashes, if market swings are happening very frequently, how frequent do you retrain a, a quant strategy to adapt to those? As, as I said, if you're doing it all the time, you're probably going to be overfitting like crazy. But if you don't do it enough, how much can you risk to being vulnerable to this type of uh, changes? Data quality in crypto is just horrible. Like you find a lot of corrupted data sets, you find a lot of uh, spoofing, watch trading, like a lot of that behavior embedded in the data set, and, and therefore, uh, a lot of the, the models typically learn a lot of bad behaviors or behaviors are not representative of market conditions. Then you have the problem that most blockchain data is anonymous or pseudonymous by, by, by nature. So you're dealing with a lot of data that you don't know exactly who belongs to addresses that you cannot point that if it's an exchange or if it's a miner or if, if it's this or that. So you need to spend a lot of time de-anonymizing that, uh, that type of data because if not, uh, if you're just using blockchain records, let's say my addresses and Coinbase's hot wallets are the same, right? If you don't use some intelligence to try to de-anonymize that, you're just assigning the same weights to things that are, uh, that are fundamentally different. And then the simple model fallacy, what we call 
uh, in in uh, in quant uh, strategies, there is this idea that simple models tend to work, and that complex deep learning models things tend to overfit and not work very well. Crypto, because it's so irregular, and uh, most simple models are not prepared for this. So if you're trying to tackle predictive scenarios with things like decision trees or linear regressions and all that, you, you're up for for a very tough ride because the market changes so much so frequently. Uh, there is so many inefficiencies that most of those models fail. We believe crypto in the long term is a model, uh, is a game of very sophisticated deep learning techniques. And on that note, I would like to show you, to talk to you just to conclude the session about some techniques uh, about uh, uh, deep learning in particular that we think are going to be very influential in crypto. Just happened that crypto as an asset class is coinciding with a renaissance of deep learning technologies and uh, deep learning technologies that are revolutionizing fields such as natural language processing, computer vision, uh, speech analysis, and things like that. And many of them are slowly making uh, inroads into capital uh, into capital market. In particular, the ones that there's some that we're really excited about. Excited about, for instance, this idea of graph neural networks that was invented in the 90s and probably forgotten. And then with the advent of social media. Uh, there have been some interesting examples in Twitter and Facebook of using graphs, uh, convolutional neural networks and things like that to create predictive models. Well, it turns out that blockchains are graphic, are, are hierarchical in nature. So this idea of using a graph model to understand patterns in a blockchain is quite interesting. Another idea that we think this is here today, uh, transformers is probably the most important development in deep learning in the last decade. These are the models that power GPT-3, that power Google Bird, that are revolutionizing language. And slowly we're seeing transformers being applied to other domains. They're being very successful in computer visions and they're being applied to time series. So there is a couple of libraries there. There is an effort from Amazon called Glue TS. There is a thing called PyTorch Forecasting. Google some, has some research on, to, uh, on this area as well of applying transformers to time series data sets, we think they can be very effective in a small time series such as, uh, uh, such as the one that you get in crypto uh, spot or derivative uh, order books. Then this idea of self-supervised learning that, that is mostly comes out of Facebook is this idea that you can start learning a lot of patterns with very little uh, supervision. It tries to mimic how babies start learning, creating representations of the world before they can actually interact uh, with the uh, with the world. So, it, looking at blockchain data sets are completely unlabeled data uh, that you cannot classify what addresses is what. Just having self-supervised models that look at that data and try to extrapolate patterns from it, we think is a very interesting technique. And finally. This idea, reinforcement learning is a thing that has been tried in traditional capital markets many times. I haven't seen very many success stories other than for portfolio optimization and, and things like that, but very, very little, like most of the, the success in reinforcement learning has been in gaming, but very little in traditional capital markets. We think this idea in decentralized finance uh, that is played in, an, in a world in which everything is visible, every trade, Every attempt of a trade is visible uh, there, uh, and you can correlate it with a specific address, with a specific holdings, with things like that. We think that having RL algorithms to just scan those uh, blockchain trades and learn behaviors organically is quite interesting, and it's probably an ideal uh, environment for reinforcement learning because it's a complete field uh, information where in traditional order books, you're not seeing right, the market makers and, and the counterparties on the other side, in DeFi, you see everything, so you have a way a, a very better, wider perspective of potential trade. So these are these are areas that we're exploring that we think could have unique applicabilities uh, to crypto. So to finalize, some practical uh, example uh, ideas of building if you're trying to build quantum strategies in crypto, some practical things that you should think about. The most stupid, simplest trades will work. Like the, the my canonical example is. The basis trade, trade with futures that doesn't work anywhere else. Uh, it works in crypto uh, extremely well for very long uh, periods of time. So you don't have to go into ultra sophisticated things or very simple ideas. The market is so inefficient that very simple ideas 
uh, work. Now, assume that if you're going to work in crypto, your infrastructure is going to be very fragile. Exchanges are going to fail. Yesterday, Coinbase and Binance were both, uh, uh, they both crashed during the, during the market uh, downturn. So you never hear about NASDAQ crashing or things like that. So this is unheard of. I mean, crypto happens every day. Data sets are really poor. Uh, so assume that you're playing with, with a very fragile infrastructure. Very many traditional quantum strategies. If you're going into crypto, don't assume that you need to invent everything from the ground up. Very many of the strategies that you have in, for traditional order books for derivatives could be adapted to centralized exchanges. I think one one does do this before, and they sort of uh, work. And then there is also plenty of opportunities for new strategies. So things like decentralized finance is a fascinating playground. New forms of derivative that we haven't. Uh, that have no analogies in traditional capital markets are super interesting. Uh, to summarize, I've gone super fast. So crypto represents a new landscape for quant strategies. The market is super immature and therefore there is a ton of opportunities, very asymmetric. Within DeFi is a new frontier for high frequency trading. Asset classes such as NFT uh, are uh, presenting trading dynamics that we need to understand and the opportunities there are uh, remarkable. And then crypto coinciding with the renaissance of deep learning technologies. I think there is a lot of these cutting edge techniques that could be super impactful in crypto way more than the impact that they could have in traditional equities or commodities or derivatives in, in, in capital markets. That's all I have. I am gonna go to questions before that. I would like to thank you very much for joining us today. My, my name is Jesus Rodriguez. You can shoot me an email if you have questions to jrintoblog.com. I write almost every day on Medium at that address. So you can contact me through Medium and I'm going to go to a couple of questions. So there is a, there is a question at the very beginning of the session that is how do you extract information from the flow in and out of the wallet? Uh, you can only get from the wallet connected to an exchange or you can analyze ledger transactions. So there, there are different ways, right? Any wallet is visible. So you got, if you're looking just at any pinpoint wallet, you can see historical transactions, the history of transactions flowing in and out. Now, the problem is that you don't know who that wallet, what that wallet is. So if you want to go to label that, right? If you want to identify the owner, if you want to see it's a miner, it's an exchange, it's a, it's a mixer, uh, it's a gaming, um, address is a lender, right? Uh, typically, the, the way we solve that problem is using machine learning classification techniques, which means you need to get some label data sets, train those classification models, that like get label data sets from exchanges uh, and train a classification model, scan the blockchain and lay, identify new exchanges or, or new miners or new things. And that for the most part works, obviously it's not 100%. Uh, accurate, but you get a statistically significant uh, uh, the, the, uh, analysis there that you can use to, to extrapolate inflows and outflows and, and things like that. Uh, then another question is, uh, do you foresee regulatory scrutiny, market abuse through like a spoofing of layering? Uh, yes, yeah, so some exchanges at Binance are dealing with a, with a tough regulatory climate. Yeah, absolutely. So crypto is a new market, it's 10, 10 years old. Uh, is extremely inefficient and with inefficiency comes a lot of bad behavior. This is not different than any other asset class in, in history. So I don't believe that crypto is more prone to this type of behavior than any other asset class. There was plenty of history of doing a spoofing algorithms and wash trading and things like that uh, in equities or emerging markets, uh, uh, equities or, or, or things like that. So I think you're seeing a lot of bad behavior uh, in crypto, there is a lot of access to inside information. And eventually, I think a lot of that is going to get uh, regulated. The fact that a few crypto companies are going gone public, they're on the path to go to go public, I think it's going to introduce uh, uh, more strict regulations into the space, and it's going to contribute to make the market uh, a little bit more, more efficient. Uh, I think those are the questions. Uh, again, if you have any other question, please feel free to reach out via email or uh, or via my uh, Medium or Twitter or something, and I, I would will, will love to be uh, in touch. And with that, I would love to thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session. I'll be posting the slides uh, probably tomorrow in, uh, in Medium, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you very much.